Hi everyone, this is lecture 5 where we're going to cover the spinal cord organization and its function. So pretty much we're going to show the, the structure and anatomy of the spinal cord and would like to spend more time on its function and its role in the nervous system. So we're going to talk about uh, not only the growth structure, but its sensory and, and motor function. <clears throat> we'll talk about a plexus. Okay. I'll briefly mention about dermatomes. Okay. And <clears throat> uh, decussation. Okay. Let's start with the organization and function of the spinal cord. Now, remember the central nervous system is composed of the brain and the spinal cord. And the spinal cord forms the inferior part of the central nervous system. So, the spinal cord is a long tubular organ that's located in the vertebral canal. Okay. And, of course, it, it, it filled that vertebral foramen that, uh, that you named from the skeletal system as SAB203. So here, this yellow part here is the vert vertebral or spinal cavity. Okay. It's also called the dorsal body cavity because, for example, in animals that are on all fours, it'll be dorsal. Okay. Now, the spinal cord passes through the opening of the skull, the form and magnum of the occipital bone, where it joins the brain stem. Okay, so here, here we see the spinal cord, okay, where it attaches to the uh, brain stem. It's al 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 almost indistinguishable where it, it joins, but it does get a little wider toward the brain stem. Some spinal cord facts. Uh, it ends between the first and second lumbar vertebrae. Okay. Uh, it measures about uh, 43 to 46 centimeters or 17 to 18 inches and its diameter is about 0.65 to 0.25 centimeters or about you know uh, a quarter to a uh, quarter to a half an inch diameter okay so the simplest way we can describe the function of the spinal cord is that it relays and processes information it's sort of the intermediate between the periphery and the brain. And so it, so it does definitely relay and process information between the two areas. So the spinal cord, we said, was an intermediate between the body and the brain. And so it receives outgoing information from the brain and sends it to the rest of the body. And it also receives incoming information from the body and sends it to the brain. So it's definitely a relay station. Okay. It's also a processing station because it does some integration and processing. For example, spinal reflexes can be carried out by the spinal cord alone. It doesn't require the brain for these uh, for some of these some of these refle spinal reflexes to occur. Now, the spinal cord contains both gray and white matter. Now the question is. Why is it gray and why is it white? Well, you might have learned in lab already that spinal gray matter contains uh, the cell bodies, dendrites, and unmyelinated axons, and that forms the spinal gray matter. Okay, and so you can see the spinal gray matter right here. Kind of looks like a little butterfly. The white matter is composed of the myelinated axons and surrounding the gray matter okay so in the spinal cord we have the gray and the white matter surrounding the centrally located gray matter the spinal cord has membranes that protect it and these membranes are called the spinal meninges they're very similar to the uh, protective layers surrounding the brain which are the cranial meninges. But for now, we'll talk about the spinal meninges. 
And as we said, they're continuous with the meninges of the brain, and there are three layers which are the same in the brain. There's an outer dura mater, uh, which means dura means tough, like dura cell batteries last a long time. And mater means mother, so this is a real tough mother. We have the middle arachnoid mater, which is it's, it's due to its spider-like, web-like appearance. And then we have the delicate pia mater. The pia means delicate. Okay, and here we see the three layers. From out, the outermost is the thickest dura mater, then the middle arachnoid mater, and then the, the one that's completely on the surface of the spinal cord is the pia mater. So here is another picture showing the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. Now, uh, there are some differences of the spinal meninges as, as the meninges we will see in the brain in the next lectures. Uh, the spinal dura mater has no periosteal layer, and the spinal pia mater anchors the spinal cord in the vertebral cavity by what are called denticulate ligaments. Okay, so here, here in, in this uh, picture, we show the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater, and here we see the denticulate ligament that's anchoring the spinal cord on either side. There are also spaces in the meninges, and these include the epidural space, the subdural space, and the subarachnoid space. So there are three spaces. The epidural space is between the dura mater and the vertebral foramen, and it's filled with veins and adipose tissue to cushion and protect the spinal cord. Okay, and so here we see the epidural space that's filled with adipose tissue here in yellow. Okay. The subdural space is, is not really a space, but it's a potential space, because if there was a space, it'd be there. <laughs> but uh, the reason why it's a potential space is because the dura mater and the arachnoid mater stick very closely to one another. So there, there's not much of a subdural space. Okay. And so here they, they draw it so you can point to it, the subdural space. The subarachnoid space lies between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. And this is special because it's filled with cerebral spinal fluid, CSF. Okay? And so we might have mentioned early on that the, the central nervous system is surrounded or bathed or buoyant in this cerebral spinal fluid, but it's also flowing through it. Okay? So here's the subarachnoid space that's containing the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Now, the subarachnoid space is the site for a lumbar punch, puncture or a spinal tap if you want to take a sample of cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. So this picture here is showing the lumbar vertebrae here, and here's a big, really big syringe here where you would take a sample of uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and it's in the in the subarachnoid space. Okay. Let's take a look now at the external spinal cord anatomy. The spinal cord extends from the foramen magnum to between about L1 and L2. Okay. Uh, it has a narrower posterior median sulcus and has a wider anterior median fissure. Okay. This is important to know because when you're looking at models of the spinal cord in the lab, Sometimes it's not easy to distinguish which sides uh, anterior and posterior. Okay. So here's the posterior median sulcus, which is bigger, a bigger groove. The anterior median fissure is smaller. Okay. So one's a sulcus and one's a fissure. The sulcus is posterior, the fissure is anterior. Okay. Now the spinal cord and forms what's called the conus medullaris, okay, at the level of L1 and L2. There, the spinal pia mater forms a, an extension called the phylum terminal. Okay, so here's the, 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 the conus medullaris where the spinal cord ends, but it continues as the phylum terminal all the way down to the sacrum. Okay. 
The spinal cord has two bulges. These are the cervical and lumbar enlargements. And they're thicker because nerve roots attach to these areas. So if we look at from the uh, posterior view, you can see the cervical enlargement and the lumbar enlargement. And if you expand this figure here, you can see that it's wider because of these nerve roots that are uh, extending from it. Now let's just take a little closer look at the spinal nerves now. These originate from the spinal cord and innervate below the head and neck. Okay. The posterior and anterior nerve roots project from each side of the spinal cord to form a spinal nerve. So a spinal nerve is formed by an anterior okay, or ventral root and a posterior root or dorsal root. Spinal nerves carry both sensory and motor impulses to and from the spinal cord. Okay. So here, here's the spinal cord. Okay. Here's the anterior. Here's the posterior. We know this because of the uh, of the sulcus and the fissure. And we see the posterior root, which is sensory in function, and we see the anterior root, which is motor in function. Together they form a spinal nerve. So that's why a spinal nerve has both sensory and motor in function. So we can see that some of the uh, sensory sensory functions are going to here a blood vessel, and here it's going to skin. And so some of the motor uh, motor roots are going to things like the lung and the skeletal muscle, for example. Now, what's in, well, another way to tell which side of the spinal cord you're looking at is to look for the posterior root ganglion, which contains the cell bodies of sensory neurons. Okay. So remember, we made a definition of ganglions like in the first lecture, and we said they lose their cell bodies of the peripheral nervous system. Okay. And we see this bulge here in the posterior root. So when you see this bulge, those are the cell bodies in the posterior root ganglion. You do not see there's no such thing as a anterior root ganglion. So here's another way of, of distinguishing what side of the spinal cord you're on. Of course, some of these crude models of the spinal cord, they don't show this swelling, and so that's a problem. But if you see it, then you know it's easy to know you're on the posterior side. Now, there are various connective tissues um, that surround nerves, in addition to spinal nerves. Okay, and so they're held together by connective tissue sheets called the epineurium. Okay, now within the nerve axons, they are, they are bundled together in fascicles. You, you've heard of the word fascicles before when you were looking at the histology of a, a skeletal muscle. Well, they use the same term here in histology of a nerve. And fascicles here are surrounded by the perineurium. Okay, so here's a nerve. And we see the groups of nerve fibers uh, in fascicles, okay? And each fascicle is surrounded by a perineurium, okay? Now each axon within a fascicle is surrounded by the endoneurium, okay? So here's, uh, here's the uh, axon, and it's surrounded by the endoneurium, okay? The bundle of spinal nerve, nerve roots extending from the conus medullaris is called the cauda equina. Okay, so from the conus medullaris, we have the cauda equina before it extends to the phylum terminal. I guess I kind of sent this a little backwards, I guess. Okay. Uh, nerve plexuses. Okay, you might have heard about these in the first lecture. These are nerve networks that form from spinal nerves. Okay, and there, there are different plexuses in the body. The major plexuses are the cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral plexuses. These are the major ones. Okay, so here is where they're located. Cervical plexus is about C1, C5. The brachial plexus is C5 to T1. And the lumbar plexus is from about L1 to L4. And the sacral plexus is L4 to S4. Okay, we'll look at one of these in more detail. The one that, that, that most people look at in detail are the brachial, uh, is the brachial plexus. 
And so we'll use that as an example of nerve plexus in detail. Okay. The brachial plexus is composed of five nerves. The axillary, the radial, the musculocutaneous, the median, and the ulnar. Okay, so some of these are kind of easy because they're named by the muscles or, or the area okay, that they innervate. And so here are the nerves again, the axillary, radial, musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar nerves. Okay. Uh, but that, that's the extent we'll go to the brachial plexus. Okay. Maybe in the lab you covered it in more detail. Another thing about uh, this uh, about spinal nerves is the our dermatomes. Okay, dermatomes are segmentation of, of the skin based on the innervation of the spinal nerves. Okay, so you can map the surface of the skin and represents all the innervation of the spinal nerves. Okay, except for the first cervical spinal nerve. Okay, and so you can map the surface of the body and you can you can actually see where, which spinal nerves are being innervated by that part of the body. Okay. Now let's take a look at the internal spinal cord anatomy. Remember we said that the spinal gray matter was butterfly shaped? Well, the butterfly shaped spinal gray matter uh, is surrounded by the white matter. Okay. I kind of, I think this is kind of written kind of backwards here. I'll, I'll have to fix that. Okay, so the white matter surrounds the gray matter, or the gray matter is deeper to the white matter. Okay, we have what's called a central canal, which is a hole that's filled with cerebral spinal fluid that runs down the middle of the cord. Okay, and remember the butterfly wings are connected by what's called the gray commissure. So the hole in the middle of the gray matter is the central canal filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And the connection between the two sides of the gray matter are called a, is called the gray commissure. Now, the spinal gray matter is divided into different horns. You have the anterior horn, the posterior horn, and the lateral horn. Of course, you have these on either side of the spinal cord. The anterior horn is associated with somatic motor function. The posterior horn is associated with both somatic and visceral sensory information. And the lateral horn is present only from the thoracic vertebrae to, to uh, part of the lumbar and has cell bodies for motor control of viscera via the autonomic, autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is associated with the lateral horn, which is only present uh, through the thoracic vertebrae to part, of the, to part of the lumbar vertebrae. Okay, so here are the horns, the posterior horn, uh, we have a lateral horn, and we have the anterior horn. Okay, and it makes sense uh, why the posterior horn is sensory and the anterior horn is motor, because remember we had the the, the uh, root, anterior and posterior roots, which were sensory and motor in function. Okay, now let's look at the spinal white matter. The white matter functions as a relay station, and it contains axons of neurons that travel to and from the brain. Now, each region of the white matter is called a funiculus, okay? The funiculus, that's, and it's organized into tracts or columns that ascend or descend the spinal cord. Those that ascend the spinal cord are sensory. Those that descend the spinal cord are motor. And you think about it. You have sensory receptors in the periphery. They're going to send sensory information to the brain, okay? Motor functions are going to go from the brain down the spinal cord out to the periphery, and those are motor. Okay, so it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Now, the ascending tracks, uh, we have some examples of them. We have the posterior columns, the spinal cerebellar tracts, and the anterior lateral system. So these are examples of ascending tracts. Okay, but the first one and the last one, it might be kind of hard to determine if it's an ascending track or not. But for the spinal cerebellar tract, you can make you can you can figure out that it must be a ascending tract because it's going from the spinal cord to the cerebellum, which is part of the brain, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. So that one you can tell it's an ascending tract. Okay.
So these are just, just for, uh, I'm not going to ask you to identify these on any question or anything, but just showing you where they're located. We have the posterior columns, okay, anterior lateral columns, okay, and here's the spinal cerebellar tracts on the side here. Now, descending tracts, okay, these are easier to, to identify because they all have prefixes and suffixes indicating which direction they're going. So we have a cortical spinal tract, reticular spinal tract, tectal spinal tract, and vestibular spinal tract. So they all end the spinal cord. So this is kind of easy going from the cortex to the spinal cord, uh, the, the reticulum to the spinal cord, uh, the tectum to the spinal cord, and the vestib vestibular nerve to the spinal cord. So they're all descending tracks. So these are a little bit easier to identify if you saw them. Okay. And again, here, here are these uh, descending tracks: cortical spinal tract, reticular spinal tract, tectal spinal tract, vestibular spinal tract. Again, I'm not going to ask you to identify them. I'm just letting you know, that, you know, for your information, where they're located in the white matter. <laughs>